Hello, I'm your host, Veronica Winters. This podcast is available on my YouTube channel at Veronica's Art. You can get it in the audio format on any podcast platform. If you enjoy this show, please rate it. Um, It helps a lot for others to discover this show. And don't forget to visit my website, veronicasart.com, to see new work, get inspired, or maybe you'd like to learn how to draw and paint. You're welcome to take one of my online video classes. So please visit veronicasart.com. Thanks so much for listening and watching. Please enjoy the show. I am honored to have the founders of Natural Pigments as my guests today. George O'Hanlon and Tatiana Zaitseva are going to share their amazing story, how they founded uh, Natural Pigments and what makes them different from other art supplies manufacturers. Based in Northern California, Natural Pigments manufactures and distributes rare and hard-to-find materials for fine artists and decorators. Uh, To my guests and the YouTube subscribers, I apologize for the quality of this video. It was a technical mistake. You still get lots of relevant information so you can create the best paintings possible. (laughs) <laughs> oh wow. <laughs> well, yeah. I'm I'm very happy that you decided to participate in the podcast. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank sure. you for invite. Thank you. So, could you introduce yourself and tell me how you decided on the idea for the company, which is Natural Pigments? Okay, I can start with that. Uh, We both started Natural Pigments in 2003. And there's there's a big backstory to all of this, of course, and I won't bore everybody with the details. But suffice to say that I started off as an artist uh, in uh, in the 1970s. But like, but I, I loved figurative art, I didn't like abstract art. And and ab- figurative art wasn't very popular at the time. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and so the only type of art that anybody could do at the time was was being an illustrator. And I didn't fancy myself as an illustrator. So, but anyway, I was an illustrator for a while. And then, of course, through that, I uh, also became a chemist and um, through part of my career. But it wasn't until the 1990s that I took an interest again in painting uh and um and i went to russia mm-hmm. and uh and and because i was very interested in uh medieval russian painting particularly and uh particularly of course uh russian iconography and uh we met or i met at the time i met tatiana but at the same time i also met uh, a, a geologist who uh introduced me to mineral and natural pigments and that uh, made a whole difference not only in my perspective of painting uh and, and of course we were doing i was learning egg tempera in russia but and fresco but uh apart from that um it was very important in oil painting and that introduction uh led me to want to introduce natural type pigments back into mainstream art uh, here back in the United States initially. And um, and I also, and the whole thing kind of just organically grew up. <clears throat> I, I didn't intend to make paint. I tended to paint with these things, but making the paint become so interesting. And because of my background in chemistry, I became even more interested in, in uh, all of this. Uh, we got married and we started the company and um, we started to uh, eventually we started making paint and and one thing led to another and here we are today so it's it's this you know <clears throat> it's just kind of uh through a series of diversions uh, actually led to this whole thing 
Mm -hmm. The whole idea is, of course, is George's idea because I nothing to do uh, to uh, with art before him, and uh, I am just like normal Decemberist wife. And, uh, <laughs> of course, Americans will not understand yeah, no, what it is. Yeah, understand that. But, uh, <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> a very, uh, very educated uh, man. Um, were sent to Siberia, where wives uh, were Holy, sent to, yeah. <laughs> with them, and so wives actually educated Siberian population. And uh, so I just I didn't speak any English, and so for me it was I work uh, all my life since I was sixteen, and so for me it was would be weird to change the country and stop working. So that was not. Well, possible. So I thought, first, of course, when we started Iconophile, that's what it was started before uh, natural pigments, because Iconophile is a non religion but um, non profit organization. We were teaching iconography first. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> so, uh, and that because it, here in this country, it was so little information about iconography. Mm -hmm. Although, Every Russian who slightly <clears throat> knew what the icons are, so they suddenly started teach the you know icon classes here, and I always make a, a joke about uh, Americans are like sponges. They are they 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 so want they need that information, but it's you can't take anywhere just or you you can't just go and suddenly take a class. You needed to find that information, and so that's uh, with the Canafile. It was much easier for me because I would find information in Russian. We will translate um, in in Russia uh, the universities and um, the connections. What George was uh, was working there before me and with me the first uh, first what probably like ten years, and uh, we did. So they were helping us with translation, and um, so we we did several journals. Uh, we had whole website. We had tours uh, of uh, iconography, and then I slowly started to uh, learn English. And then, <laughs> then the time when natural pigments come up. So then. At least I could communicate um, half intelligently with George, and um, so that that's how it started. And of course, again, it started as his hobby. We never ever thought then it will be commercial products or even company will grow out of this garage because in garage we, you know, it was fun. You know, it was really fun because he he was just because. Um, besides that, of course, he had another business what really support us as a family. And um, that business was another 13 years in our life and that uh, that helped us. And uh, so, that, so that business was in design. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, did you meet in Moscow? Was it in Moscow? It was St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg. Okay. Okay. So, then that makes even more sense. <laughs> yeah. So for me, uh, St. Petersburg is my city. I, I I can't even say city. It's my town. You know, it's like mm -hmm. I I uh, I had my education there. I had my, you know, uh, I I mean, this is my life. That the although I'm from Lithuania, mm -hmm. but I I had my education there. And you do know that every time when it's college in Russia, so then that's where you develop that relationships with whatever place you have, whatever people. And so that's why uh, Moscow, I don't know much. And I really, <clears throat> it's it's really not, not even, I, I mean, obviously it has an interest, but uh, for me as a Russian, so for mm -hmm. me, Petersburg is my, my city. And I love Moscow. Yeah. Because so it's, <laughs> it's thoroughly Russian, whereas yeah. St. Petersburg is, is more European. It's just, um, I think it's uh, the culture is very different. It's more cultural. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 more uh, it's more cosmo. Saint Petersburg is more cosmopolitan. The architecture, of course, is is European. Mm -hmm. 
um, except for little enclaves of, of very definite Russian uh, architecture. But Moscow is definitely, mm -hmm. and and I love that. I love that. That. So, George, did you speak Russian when you... No. <laughs> no? How did you communicate? <laughs> it's... Uh, uh, I, I, we, I, we drew originally, pictures. Of course, originally, uh, <laughs> uh, when he came to, to Russia, so he had the interpreter. Of course, we, we had the uh, uh, interpreter. Just for a few to, days, though. Few, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then, was, then uh, I had my vocabul uh, the vocabulary. So, we, yeah, so we just... We used, uh, we used a dictionary. Yes, and, and, and uh, so, there was no Google translation at the no, time. No, no, that time. And uh, and I drew pictures. Yeah. And I had a little notebook, and I was able to sketch out ideas. And and it's uh, it's amazing what you can communicate when you have willing Twi parties. You know, <laughs> 22 years later, we are looking back to that situation, and uh, believe me, we are talking about our meeting almost every week because every week we like surprised like 22 years later i was like really how did we do this <laughs> so, because now we we uh, speak same language but uh, that time i we really we don't even we don't remember how it was but we do remember then it was very easy easy i i i, 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 I mean remember it, there, struggle so there, i had struggle here yeah. when i came here yeah i yeah. did I did struggle very much. And it was more and, of uh, a cultural change rather than, yeah. uh, rather than yeah. a language issue. Yeah. 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 But yeah, yeah, that's... So in what university did you study the iconography? It's not... An, uh, so he went I, to I, universities and the studios. Yes, I, uh, I was working with artists directly. And what was interesting mm -hmm. is that many of the artists uh that were painters so i was working with these artists directly in Yaroslavl and uh saint petersburg and moscow and what's interesting is that they of course all went to universities they were educated in art mm -hmm. but no education in, in iconography obviously because uh because most of their education was in the soviet union mm -hmm. so they were all self-taught in iconography, because there were very few iconographers, mm -hmm. let's say prior to the 1990s. I mean, we we did have. We had of course, some. Of we course, had, yeah, of course, but, we have Grabar Institute, which mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Avchinikov was our. I can't call him mentor because he was, you know, uh, he was very um, unusual person, and so <laughs> we. It took for us years to to understand uh, why he he was who he was how he behave and so but grabar institute was uh very eye open for our uh, uh, opening for us because of course you, you see although we did work with universities it was always um they studied the theological part of the mm -hmm. and uh and the art separate from religion and um uh, of course for people here you, they probably don't even understand how it is. With 70 years, we lived as, as you know, as a very religious uh, nation. We lived 70 years without um, proper, yeah. So, but once, uh, of course, it was always in our houses. Always, we had some grandmother who would. <laughs> <laughs> you know, for, there was, there was for candy I, or for sugar, uh, we'll tell you to pray. And so, and as a children, we all learned that. But uh, as a, during the perestroika, suddenly everything changed. So I remember going to church as an 18 years old uh, um, come some all girl. <laughs> so that's uh, it's again. So. Uh, that was needed, and then where all suddenly where this all icons come from? They they really came from modern artists who switch, and it's not like they many of them didn't have that call. They just had the necessity to survive through the um, horrible time what we had the nineties in mm -hmm. uh, in Russia, and. Um, Veronica, I don't know when when did you move here? I left uh, Russia at the end of the 90s. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so, I, I remember it very well. Yeah. yeah. So for me, it's of course, uh, I left Russia. Um, my parents moved to Lithuania when I was 14. So and then, you know, very quickly, Lithuania and Latvia and, and so Baltic countries become uh, their own countries, not republics anymore. But still, 90s were always, uh, I mean, everywhere was horrible at that time. And so that's... Uh, and it, it was actually amazing to me because uh, when I first went to Russia, I, uh, I wrote to the universities in various locations and, uh, and museums, and they opened up themselves up completely and i you know i wasn't no i wasn't anybody known mm, yeah but they were i i think they were just amazed that uh that american would be interested in medieval russian art mm -hmm. with the interest mm -hmm. that i had and and uh um and and that was uh that was quite it was it, very impressive for me that we were uh the relationships we developed with the uh, universities in in russia so quickly and and they were so open to us and very transparent it was amazing uh it was an amazing experience they were much nicer to him than to me <laughs> yes i know uh i, I think uh, russians treat foreigners differently yes I, at I, least I, in my experience i don't yeah. know yeah. I'm, 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 and I'm certain that's that's correct Plus and, uh, but <laughs> but it was such a great and warm introduction mm -hmm. uh, to Russia and uh, it was very impressive and I think actually what's amazing is that a lot of foreigners who uh, who go to Russia have that same experience because mm -hmm. I I know many others who have and uh, uh, and even though in, in, in Russia, it's, it's uncommon to see people smile on the street, but, but they are genuinely warm people. And, it, uh, and it, that is, that's very impressive. It's very yeah, impressive. wonderful. It's a far cry from what we're, you know, what we think of now, but <laughs> mm -hmm. so. Uh, I think Russians are very hospitable people when yes. you get to know them more yes. personally. But yes, no one smiles on the street. If you smile, you are considered being crazy. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. See, uh, I, I was surprised. I was surprised how everybody met him. And so when I remember like first time when we went through that, he had the it's not even tour because he organized just one stop after another from one university to another studio. And so to, um, I was surprised how they met. And at that time, I didn't speak English, but everybody with whom he was meeting, yeah, obviously everybody they spoke, English. spoke English. And they <clears throat> were so kind and nice to him. And so, and I thought like, wow, did I miss something? Suddenly I came from Lithuania and suddenly I see that culture. And I thought like, wow, I, I think for the, you know, 20 years I lived in Lithuania, I suddenly lost that. And then that's why when we met it and we uh, first our tour to, to Russia, it was a golden ring. Mm -hmm. And we brought our first 13 people to there. And it was incredible tour. It was incredible. All these 13 people, you know, one, one person already died, but uh, we still keep very tight connection and um because that was absolutely all, all of life changing them all of them all said of it us. was a life changing experience so what we did is we as part of iconofa which was this nonprofit that uh taught uh mostly americans but also some europeans and south mm -hmm. americans uh about uh, uh, basically eastern christian art orthodox art and uh, but i can't call it all orthodox because a lot of it predates uh, the, uh, the split between uh, the Western and Eastern churches. But um, what's interesting is that uh, we organized these tours and we focused on, on the development of this art. And it was so important to see the art in place, in the places where it was born. And that changed people's concept of medieval 
and Eastern Christian art. It was actually the entire Eastern Mediterranean art. I, I can't even call it, you know, just Christian art. But um, uh, and it was it, it was uh, an incredible experience. We organized a number of tours in Russia, uh, Greece, Turkey, and Egypt. And these were Christian art in Egypt. A lot of people don't think oh. about that. Mm -hmm. But the uh, but the phenomenon of Christian art in Egypt was tremendous, and uh, and for Tanya that was of course a life changing experience because that was one of her dreams to go to Egypt and that was my stipulation. I said I will marry you if you will bring me to Egypt. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> guys. But it was my my dream because I uh, I so many years as a as a teenager I was uh, studying and I was learning and I was like oh god that that was something and you remember if if you uh, I'm I kind of assuming then we are almost the same age and so we are sharing the same experience in Russia where you could not live anywhere so you could not go it's now you know every Russian almost every Russian can go to Turkey or Egypt without any problems but it was not the case before and uh, and I remember when George uh, promised me like well no problem I will take you to Egypt I'm like okay I will marry you <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> so no, but that was surprise actually when he uh, he gave uh, he decided to have this tour and again, like many things in our life. Um, I mean, George and uh, mine. So everything, like every step we do, we do kind of without not without thinking. But first, it's an impulse. It's like th that was the impulse to go back to Russia. Uh, and have the first tour. It we didn't know where it will lead us, but we just understood that we need to do that. So that we we had that first <clears throat> tour with our 13 people, and I I I thought, oh my God, that was so so great for me because I uh, back went back to of course to to my homeland for George because we had this most incredible 16 days and then of course then after six years of these tours we had the you know every every country what uh, possible uh, with uh, iconography but then we realized then it's not enough so we had the natural pigments uh, in 2003 and uh, because I I have always joking about iconophile because it took all George's time and it was non-profit and I told him then I want to eat once in a while <laughs> so I want something for profit so we created natural pigments even that I didn't see then where it will lead George has this this incredible ideas every time and I I always call him my balloon and I'm his stone <laughs> him because he always has this most craziest ideas and then he actually make them happen and that's that's how you know our our life is always on the run no I, and iconophile actually set the stage for natural pigments because iconophile was <clears throat> was really about education yeah um, and we were educating people about art and art practices. And so, and because of that, we had to provide natural, natural pigments. And the first natural pigments we brought, uh, from our contact in Russia, uh, the geologist, um, who is a great friend of ours. He passed away, uh, not so long ago, but, uh, great friend of ours. And he sourced these important minerals. These were ancient minerals that were used in painting for for thousands of years. And uh, so he sourced them. And, and I remember we took them. And if you can imagine, this was uh, actually uh, post 2000, post 9, to, post yeah, 9 11. Yeah, we were taking bags of powder in our luggage through <laughs> through Sheremetyev uh, Airport in Moscow. Wow. Luggage, 
kilos of different powders uh, in our in our luggage and uh, to bring them to back to the United States because uh, in order to uh, in order to teach people really the the uh, how to paint they needed the actual materials because the 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 process was so important out of and, and that's why natural that's why natural pigments actually evolved because we needed to have an outlet to sell the the product uh the pigments and so for years we were actually just selling pigments hence the name and and then it wasn't until about 2007 that that i found the the biggest moment in in natural pigments history was when i discovered that these pigments behaves differently in oil than modern oil paint that was amazing mm -hmm. and because of that I, 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 I thought, gee, you know, artists need to understand this. Their paint can actually do things they never thought it could do. And also led me to the, to the belief that the old master's paints, which is now correct, behaved very differently from modern. And, and it allowed artists to explore different techniques and, and methodology in their painting. So, uh, so we started making paint that way. Mm -hmm. uh, is with it, these is pigments. it right to say then, basically not um, not many even uh, <clears throat> scientists figure out, I know you found a couple yeah. uh, papers about the particle size, but nobody before George were talking about this. And uh, in, uh -huh. Actually, it was my next question, if you could like talk about your Rublev oil paints and how they're different from other brands. Sure. Yeah. Yep. So part of this was in in this discovery was the way that these pigments were behaving very differently. These were, and it wasn't because they were necessarily natural pigments. Uh, it was the fact that how you make natural pigments results in a heterogeneous particle size and shape, and and I. Um, and I understood that uh, initially, and when I, but I, what I didn't understand is when you when you add that into oil paint, the mm -hmm. paint then behaves differently, and it behaves differently based on the pigments rather than the oil, necessarily the oil. The oil has some effect on that, uh, and as a result, the um, uh, this influenced the rheology. The rheology is the behavior of a, what they call a non-Newtonian substance, which is a, a substance that is not necessarily a fluid, but it's also not a solid. Mm -hmm. uh, paint is an example, and there's many, many examples of what are non-Newtonian fluids, uh, but paint is just one example of that. Um, so the, 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 the re really important thing was this difference in behavior, uh, and what I, thought was so great was that I, I could share this with artists. And I looked up papers about this in, in uh, scientific journals, and there I only found two small references in, in conservation science papers, uh, one in the National, uh, National Gallery Technical Bulletin, and the, it only discussed it just as an aside. So, and, and there's good reason why, it's because when conservation scientists are looking at old paintings, they don't think about what the paint behaved or how it behaved while the artist was using it. They're thinking about the composition of the paint today mm -hmm. because that's what, that's what they have. And, mm -hmm. and how do they intervene with the degradation forces that are going on in the painting? So uh, I thought, okay, I, I could make paint like that. And we started making paint. I, I bought a mill and we started making paint and uh, and the first thing I did is I did what most modern paint manufacturers would do. I put a pigment stabilizer in the paint. Mm -hmm. That changed everything. The paint stopped behaving how it was when it was just the pigment and oil. And so I thought, well, that's what do I do now? I can't make paint in the modern sense how. Mm -hmm 
modern paint manufacturers and would you make need it. to um, to explain what it is yeah. the stabilizer so the stabilizer would be and and today all other brands use a pigment or uh, or stabilizer it is um, uh, is an anti settling agent uh, such as aluminum stearate or magnesium stearate um, so it's it's any one of those things and and some use castor wax or even beeswax as a stabilizer and so um and when they put that in there it it helps to store the paint for long periods of time because it prevents to mm -hmm. a large degree not entirely the paint from separating the pigment and oil from separating uh so uh when we so when we made paint we found that the paint started separating quite rapidly we couldn't store it in tubes for very long so um so i then packed uh packed up the family took them to england because there i understood in england they were making paint in the 19th century but they didn't have the modern stabilizers that came into existence in the 20th century so uh so i studied what was going on in modern in manufacturing of artist paints in in england in, during the 19th century and i found some differences and we came back and we introduced those differences into our process i should and mention, it changed it changed yeah, uh, I, how how things worked i should mention because uh, george actually connected winsor and newton and um, usually uh, companies don't invite uh, the um, competitors. competitors. We were, of course, we were not competitors for, uh, at all for that. At that, that time. Yeah, the, uh, yes, yes, that. <laughs> so what happened, but they understood what he was looking for. And that time still, at that time, were great chemists working for Winsor and Newton, and Winsor and Newton still was Winsor and Newton, and it was I think last year of that great company what fell apart afterwards, but they did take us to their laboratory laboratories, and they show us everything what they could including that machine what was making the mother uh, mother lake they took us to the matter lake production which was which, fabulous and so which people uh, probably on 21st end of the 21st century will think then that, that was some kind of mystery so it was not exist we did see that it did exist and it was made up to that year they still were making uh, mother lake <coughs> that that uh, machine they were they were making matter lake the way they made it in the early part of the 19th century and apparently they were using the same equipment uh, that uh, George Field developed. George Field was a um, was a, basically a dyer and color maker in the early part uh, uh, in England in the 19th century, and um, uh, they then took his process and continued that process. It was phenomenal. Uh, so so Winsor and Newton had that uh, beautiful color. It's rose matter, mm -hmm. and um, and so up to 2007, it still was uh, probably they, they what we understood, they made enough pigment for next couple years. And so if all the artists uh, had the mother uh, rose matter, that was was the, the original color. And now, of course, it's mixture <coughs> of the pigments pretending like mother lake. That's what happening. Actually, that's what happening in the industry right now. So we're companies. So yeah. uh, are you saying that, uh, you know, contemporary paints don't last very long? They fade? Is that the, the, pr the problem with the paint? We will not, come to not that. Necess <laughs> not necessarily. Um, so there, there's two parts to that. Obviously, like, how is it different? Uh, that's what I'm trying to well, understand. So, in terms of rublev paints, uh, rublev color paints, they are different because of the fact that we do several things. One is we're we're using. If you look at our line of paints, I would say eighty percent of the line is composed of natural 
pigments. Mm -hmm. So we have a, and, and although other paint lines may have natural pigments in their line, mm -hmm. it's a smaller proportion of the line. We have a greater variety. So mm -hmm. for, just to give you an example, most paint lines have one raw umber. We have nine raw umbers. But then you look again on the back of the tube of that raw umber. Most companies have synthetic pigments pretending mm -hmm. as a raw umber. Right. So even the names now, let's say an ochre or a sienna or an umber, which is always for for centuries for centuries has always been associated with a natural pigment, is now no longer a natural pigment. It is a synthetic pigment or a mixture of synthetic pigments. Well, it makes sense because it cheapens uh, the cost of the paint. And no, it's, it, it's not, not always. always done that for it's that on reason. Some cases, In some yes. cases it is, but, but not always. Uh, what probably the biggest reason is, uh, is that it's more consistent than natural pigments. You see, if you're digging out of the ground, you can't expect nature to produce exactly the same color mm -hmm. throughout that area. So there will be a little bit of a shift. We call it a color wobble. We get this little bit of shift in the color from batch to batch. And it's because of, you know, where, where that pigment originated. Now, uh, for, for a large company producing massive amounts of paint, much bigger than us, let's say like Windsor Newton. By the way, Windsor Newton no longer is making paint in, in England. All of their paint is made in Le Mans, France, where they also make Sennelier, mm -hmm. uh, Bourgeois, and so forth. It's all, it's, it's all under one massive company called, called Colart. So uh, there, if you've got, you know, you've got a quality control lab and you're seeing the shift you know, it, it becomes a management, uh, a, pro, uh, a product assurance or product quality control but problem. But we should, again, mention why is that? Because see, before old masters were making for themselves, and even later, let's say, you know, a little bit later, mm -hmm. even if they didn't make for themselves, so they had apprentices making. But now, and it was an artist, you know, now every... Um, person who paints twice a year call themselves artists mm -hmm. and where they go in and buying their colors they're going to stores they never they don't the most that kind of artist they don't even understand what's the pigment mm -hmm. and how the paint is made and how of course you can't expect even them to uh, understand the behavior but for people who sell the colors for them, if imagine the company sell two tubes of, uh, so one, once they sell one color and half year later they sell another color. And then of course that kind of artist will freak out and say like, Jesus, this is different color. I know I bought exactly the same tube, but this is, the, the, so that's where we, we need to say right. why. So, you know, you uh, companies are now. They, they so are, what's the advantage of using natural pigments? Like what's the main advantage of using natural pigments in paint as opposed to synthetic? I can't say there's an advantage necessarily, but that really shouldn't be what artists are always interested in. Artists are interested in having as many, as well as anybody in the field, having as many tools at mm -hmm. your disposal as possible. Why would you limit yourself to a set of colors that behave in one manner mm -hmm. when you can have colors that have a wide range of subtlety, a wide range of behavior where it flows under the brush differently, mm -hmm. where it it can be extended differently where it uh it will react to the per personality the I nervous see. system of the artist rather than the artist always having to and and actually this is a kind of a problem with modern artists is that and and why artists use so many mediums is because they have 
basically a small set of tools that they now have to change or mitigate to match their technique and style. Mm -hmm. And just is going to have a very different technique and style. So in, why in why in fact the medium, the word as a medium came together with the modern um paint. Well the idea the idea the, of a the yeah. idea of a medium because artists didn't have mediums per se when you go back into let's say the 16th or the 17th centuries, uh, because they made their paints. So they mm -hmm. could make the paint do exactly what they wanted. Mm -hmm. They didn't have to buy uh, something off the store shelf that was pre-designed for one idea. You see, the paint maker has his or her own idea what that paint should do, behave, mm -hmm. look like. But the artist in, in uh, let's say, in the 17th or 16th century, they made the paint exactly how they wanted it. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, imagine, you know, we, we tend to think that our modern consumer world offers us so many options. And in a way, it does. But the options are still limited choices. When you make things your own, you have an unlimited range of choices. Mm -hmm. So so what really what Rublev does is offer artists an alternative to their palette today. It's not that it's a superior palette, it is a different palette, and it has a different behavior. It's always noticeable. Every artist that uses a Rublev color immediately, and except for perhaps a hobbyist who doesn't understand paint itself, but any, any professional, clearly, when they start using a Rublev color, they see the difference. Now, do some, and some absolutely love that, and some don't, and that's perfectly fine, because mm -hmm. it, it's it's not possible to make something that pleases everybody on I the planet. I always <laughs> say, don't judge us for uh, by one two, uh, because every color, absolutely every color on our uh, on our palette, behaves completely different. That's why we have six yellow ochres. So then, you as an artist can. You know, you can buy lemon ochre, uh, whereas the bigger particles were very transparent yellow ochre, where, uh, and it will behave long and stringy, <clears throat> where the blue ridge yellow ochre will be much more powerful. The particles are so small. And so, and it's, so every artist actually can find something what works specifically for him. That's why it is difficult life for us, but we choose that because it was fun for him. Again, it was if it's it, a challenge. If, if we <laughs> would from the beginning, we'll think about like let's make money, let's make a profit with. But that was the hobby. That was never even thinking like okay, let's. That's why the we have five red ochres, and again. Most of them absolutely nutty colors. They <laughs> misbehave, and so it's like one artist uh, said, and it's like children. You know, we have, you know, range of children, <laughs> five or six of them. Yes, and so you love, uh, absolutely love them, but you hate some of their, you know, characters. And same as our colors, we we always saying then and. Uh, the treatment, how we make our colors, are they are completely different than uh, because we, we in order to, for them behave, so we um, store them, we age them mm -hmm. until they they will behave <clears throat> how at least we want. But it doesn't mean that like I know. see. Yeah. You know, a good illustration of this is I, I, I just saw a uh, a comment from one of our artists, and by the way, because. What the other unusual thing about what natural pigments did is we started off as an as an a, not only a manufacturer but an e-commerce company. So we have direct contact. Now a lot of companies don't. There are a few of them that that start our small boutique uh, uh, art materials manufacturers, but a lot of companies don't have this direct communication with all of their customers. We do. Mm -hmm. 
And so we get all kinds of feedback. And I just got a feedback from one customer who uh, bought, uh, we have, we make two lead whites, one of them, the lead white number two, which is ground in linseed, uh, excuse me, walnut oil. Uh, it is very stringy. And, and, uh, and this artist was complaining that every time they picked up the, the paint, the little string followed off of it. And, and they complained that the little strings were going all over their palate. You know exactly what that is. And <gasps> the amazing thing about it is that is why some artists absolutely love that. That's why it's because it, it, it gives them a different world in which they can create, imagine creating a font texture. line or texture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And but that's not for everybody. So mm -hmm. obviously, you know, this artist absolutely couldn't understand how to work with that. But that's why we have another lead white, which doesn't do that. And so, see, that's the subtlety. Now, that, that's lost on an amateur, obviously. And, um, and if you look at the, the major art materials companies, they're producing largely for amateurs. That's who their market is. That's not our market. We, we produce entirely for professionals because they understand what we're doing. And this iconophile, the fact that we were doing all this education, this actually carried over into natural pigments. We do more education. Um, I, I mean, it's, it's just- That's why it, logically- It's just an amazing amount. If you look at our website, I've written- uh, over Yes, articles. yeah, so you have a, an amazing uh, blog. Yeah. Yeah, an and, amazing and, blog uh, collection. Yeah. We, we produce, uh, now we're producing uh, uh, YouTube videos on all these aspects of But art. I can tell you again how it started. It was so, again, from out of nowhere because uh, we were interested in, uh, in pigments. George started writing articles and about pigments. And so 2006 or seven, so. uh, 2007, <clears throat> the National Gallery invited him for first his lecture in nat uh, National Gallery for the pigments. And we thought, who is interested in pigments? So restorers, we expected maybe 30 people to come to that lecture. And so National Gallery gave us the smallest room, what they had there. And then for our surprise, we had 300 some people. People were sitting on stairs, you know, on the stage, listening to him. And we were like, wow, that's strange. So imagine, so then suddenly he started to have these lectures, uh, one after another. So seven lectures la later, we understand that people started complaining to us, like, okay, you are giving on big stages, but we are in here in small, you know, towns. We don't even know what, where to take that information. That's how we started our um, uh, painting best practices. That was the, the first hour class, which was two days, he puts all that information from all his lectures together to that first uh, class. And then we started to travel with this class. And then we realized artists don't know anything about oh, yeah. it. Yeah. Nothing. It's Zero. It doesn't matter in what country you are or mm -hmm. how long you painting. If it's three years of you on school or 40 years of you teaching. And so artists just realize that they have tube of the pain and mediums from their teachers you know and that's that's it and uh, and then they started call george because everything failing apart so tell me uh, um a lot of artists do acrylic underpainting before applying like oil paint over it is it okay or it's a horrible idea of doing that you mean an underpainting in in, in, a, in acrylic paint acrylic. and then going over this oil paint? In 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 theory, it should be okay. Uh, okay. Mainly because we, uh, you know, there. What people don't understand is that uh, they they're they're always confused. We know that water and oil don't mix. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but a lot of people don't understand that acrylics don't actually dissolve in water. They're okay. suspended. It's, it's a, it's a suspension in water. Mm -hmm. 
But once it's dried, acrylics have actually greater affinity for oils than they do for water. The, the, the problem is, is that in order to make acrylics um, dispersible in water, they have to add ingredients that then make the acrylic susceptible to water, which is a problem. But that's, that's a separate issue. Uh, acrylics have their own issues. Oil paints have issues, of course. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's possible to paint over an acrylic. Uh, and, and, what uh, we know today. What we know today. Now, we, we may learn that there are some issues later. Uh, that's a possibility. We recently learned that oil paint will not work on a acrylic medium. So uh, now, now I'm talking about acrylic paint, but mm -hmm. just simply a medium. Mm -hmm. So if you put a medium, let's say, for instance, you apply a clear medium onto, and this and this has actually been done. Some artists have put a clear medium onto an, a, a canvas or a piece of wood because they want the color of the canvas or the wood to come through on the painting, and then they apply oils over that. That is problematic because uh, we now found, or at least Golden uh, discovered, uh, Golden Artist Colors discovered recently that uh, oil paints will begin to craze or crackle uh, in very short period of time over a pure medium. That is a medium without any pigments. But that's different from acrylic paint or acrylic grounds or what they so-called acrylic gessos because mm -hmm those have pigments in them and uh and we now we know or we believe we know that oil paint will adhere well to that okay so yeah. <laughs> that part is okay so yeah. how do i do i know if um if a gesso is of high quality like whenever you look at them they all seem to be the same um the only difference is the name the brand name Right. So that's that's a very good. That's a very good question. Um, in um, in about 2012, Tatiana and I participated in a round robin study. Uh, I think it was around that time, uh, maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, it was a round robin study that was being um, sponsored by the American Society of Testing Materials, and they were developing at the time uh, a standard for acrylic grounds. The, the, this particular standard, uh, and it was a standard to test acrylic grounds for its uh, various properties, like uh, will paint adhere to it well? Does it have a sufficient flexibility to mm -hmm. be applied to a canvas? Uh, does it prevent um, uh, what they call support-induced discoloration and so forth, which is a, an anathema for acrylic paints? on uh, natural type uh, supports. And so uh, what we found was very surprising. Now this round robin was also a blind test. In other words, we were given canvases that were prepared with different grounds. Okay? We didn't know uh, companies. We didn't know which brands they were. They mm -hmm. were different acrylic grounds. And our job was to apply acrylic paints and oil paints to these canvases and gel mediums and gel mediums and then test them. Mm -hmm. And what we found was surprising even to us because we found that some of the grounds, acrylic paint would actually just peel right off of it. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, what was interesting was that in almost all the cases, the oil paint adhered fairly well. Huh. Uh, but the acrylic paint was actually lifting off some of these canvases. So uh, what this tells us is that it does matter mm -hmm. the quality of the acrylic ground. It matters a big deal. And so you want to be sure and buy acrylic grounds from companies that are very reputable, that have done an, you know testing of their own products. And I'm not just talking about quality control testing. I'm talking about really performance testing. And there's a few of them out there like that. Golden Artist Colors is mm -hmm. one uh, and would definitely would the, be a good candidate. But, oh, but you know, but you also see overall, artists that are... Overall price matter. Yeah, you see artists and they're as like a badge of honor. They're going out and saying, I bought this five gallon... Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, the 
of it's acrylic ground terrible. for twenty dollars and they got a good deal. Yeah. But in reality, did they? You mm -hmm. know, and and what they're doing is they're you know what we the expression in English is, uh, uh, um, you know, penny. Uh, what is that? Um, <laughs> I'm going to do a George Bush thing now. <laughs> Say whatever that is. So it's uh, it's uh, uh, penny, penny, penny wise pound foolish. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Like in other words, they're they're saving money, but in reality, what they're doing is they're wasting the potential waste of their time and labor, which so many artists is amazing to me that so many artists are willing to sacrifice their mm -hmm. time just to save a little bit of money on the cost of their materials, mm -hmm. which is uh, which is penny wise pound foolish. It, it's it's an incredibly short sighted way of doing art. Overall, Veronica, what we because uh, we you know, we <clears throat> are participating uh, how many years already with ASDM and so we hear this firsthand. So artists need to understand then everything in our life is getting more expensive, everything. I mean, materials, what we, uh, the COVID kicked us so bad. And uh, what's happening right now, it's even worse because everything as a, ma the raw material we buying, it's not even 100%. Usually it's 150 and 200% more. But we can't, I mean, we small company, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we we understand where we can wobble. But when we talk about big companies and when you suddenly buy the from big company very cheap uh, materials, you need to understand then something, somebody cut the corners. Mm -hmm. And uh, it is OK <clears throat> if you are painting twice a year. But if that is your career, and by the way, traveling with painting best practices all over the world, literally from all over the world, we now understand then artists being sued by galleries, by museums, by private customers, because the practice what was before oh you know what i will paint it and as long as it was sold it's not my problem mm -hmm. it doesn't work anymore so artists need to understand then they are liable to their customers mm -hmm. saying yeah. what we that we saying we as a company we are liable to you because if you buy from rublev we stand by our name and you know whatever problems could occur you can call us and we can figure out so far so far but we are dealing with everybody else's problems that Every, that's a russian yes, thing, it's right? russian, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so everybody <laughs> So everybody calling about everybody else's problem, but they calling him. You know, this mm -hmm. is this is the it's becoming, and he is now advocating to all com uh, all other companies on the world because he does explain artists. So in many cases, it's not even actually about the materials, but how artists abuse the materials. So that's what happening. And nobody is teaching if it's oil paint. It can't behave as the watercolors. But that's what now nowadays everybody is trying to make the oil colors thin. It physically, chemically, it can't be. So, but if you jeopardize that, you need to understand what it will be on the end. And so that's why on painting best practices, we are like, you know, we explain artists what they can what they cannot do with certain mediums and so we try and we talk about everything acrylic tell me about the white paint there are several kinds of white paint so mm. what's the most archival um white paint that artists can use so in in um when you're talking about oil paint uh, mm -hmm. red white is still okay. the best white and and the reason is because and this is 
it's been known that for some time that lead white uh, was toxic. Mm-hmm. Well, it's toxic, of course, and, mm-hmm. and that's been well known for a long period of time. But what's what has also been known is that the lead reacts to the oil, and and the reaction is to make very strong, flexible films. Mm-hmm. We didn't understand, however, until the last, I would say. Uh, 30 years, we didn't understand why that was, but the understanding mm-hmm. now is much greater. Uh, are there problems with, with lead, white, and oil? Of course, but there's problems with everything. It's uh, mm-hmm. not, you know, everything doesn't, doesn't behave perfectly, uh, but we get the best performance with lead, white. Titanium white in oil does not make, it's, it's a useful white, uh, mm-hmm. of course, but it doesn't make strong paint films. In fact, um, one several studies indicate that the paint films made in oil with titanium white be, are very weak huh. and uh, and somewhat brittle. So mm. uh, and and they age rapidly so that they don't form good paint films. So lead white, and in fact, lead white is the only color that makes really good paint films in oil paint. Now, of course, if you're talking about acrylics. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to use lead white. Mm-hmm. Uh, titanium white. Tempera doesn't uh, make. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to use uh, lead white and tempera. Certainly not in in gouache and other types of techniques. There, and the you know we we promote the use of lead white, and it's not you know not because we we're trying to in, as 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 one one uh, person accused me of handing plutonium to children. <laughs> Oh my God! Um, yes, that was uh, that was an actual accusation. I hope uh, she won't listen yeah. to the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe she no, will. Maybe yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> but in reality, we're not advocating use of toxic materials, except that they have a benefit. Mm-hmm. And uh, and you know, in, if you look at industry overall, there's always things that have a benefit that outweigh the potential toxic. And there's ways to safeguard yourself. And and, uh, all of this information about artists dying from lead poisoning is totally inaccurate. So it's inaccurate, oh, okay. Because that was one of my questions. Right, in terms of lead poisoning from their paint. Now, Uh uh, and in fact, it's it's very rare that someone dies directly from lead poisoning. They could die from complications uh, that are exacerbated by lead poisoning. When they drink water from you know, the but old there's pipes. you know, and you know, like you'll read, uh, like there was a, a story in the Guardian, you know, this bastion of of truth <laughs> um, that talked about uh, Caravaggio dying from his paint. Well, that was a total fabrication, oh, no. and it was designed to sell headlines. Mm-hmm. Uh, obviously, because if you look at the story itself, we really don't know how Caravaggio died because we really don't have his body mm-hmm. <laughs> in the first place. Now, of course, there's a little town in Italy where they for sure think they have Caravaggio's body because, of course, it gives them a badge of honor. But in 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 truth, we don't really know. So we don't know how he died. But Most no, likely, no. he Let's probably... Let's talk about that. Right. But lead, lead can be used safely if you just simply avoid ingesting it. Uh, okay, or, okay. or if you're working with the powder, breathing the powder. It's, it's that simple. It, it, it's not this radioactive substance. Uh, there are no fumes. That's been long proven. There's no uh, toxic fumes from lead white you know, when you use it normally as in oil paint. So it's really, uh, it's it's an overblown concern. But at the same time. But it is, yeah. obviously it is, it is concern. But an artist should always protect themselves in, you know, from the materials they're using, regardless of whether they know it's toxic or not. Because we really don't know all of the toxicity of all the materials we use today. And in fact, there's probably an equal amount of toxic materials underneath your kitchen sink, 
or in your mm -hmm. cleaning pantry. I mean, it's amazing. Cleaning supplies. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. exactly. So it's just, we just have to be more aware and protect ourselves. And, and just, that's why we advocate all this education. We, we always talk to artists about safety in the studio. And probably the biggest concern for artists is the use of solvents. There, they should be far more concerned than actually lead white. Can I just go back mm -hmm. a little bit? Obviously, if you do <clears throat> have children, and children are notorious eating everything around and leaking everything around, so we hope <clears throat> as an artist you don't leak your brushes. Although we do, we do have artists who usually it's in tempera or watercolors, but in oils, not not the case. But if you do have a children and you paint with uh, with lead, so keep it uh, far away because that's keep it under lock. But yeah. that's yeah. where the danger comes because this is not for <clears throat> uh, in most adults uh, and especially after so certain age, it just passing through. Um, if it's uh, it came as a paint, let's say not as a pigment when you breathe it, but for children it's different story, and so then uh, of course absolutely not. And uh, but same time, be educated person. So it's it's amazing for us. We we meet artists. So then, uh, you know any any profession you take, people go to schools learning how to you know to be safe. And the artists don't know anything about safety. That's why in in uh, we actually that's what George just mentioned about the, the solvents. We tell you that the most danger actually not even the pig pigments like cadmiums and lead because mm -hmm. cadmiums. Let's talk about that too. So you do need to have uh, <coughs> gloves anyway, but the most danger come with turpentine and I mean the solvents or odorless, odorless minerals, minerals any yes. solvent yes actually. and so and we don't have a <laughs> one week in here in uh, in uh, ruble of colors where artists call us and they they tell us horrible stories how they struggle with uh, with solvents and so that that's real danger so what's the safest solvent is it by is it gamzol or Oh, no. There is no safe solvent. No safe, like no safe thing. They're all. Let's uh, because, Robert forgive us. So uh, we are good, good friends with him, but that's this is was good, good. Um, um, because so it, it's important not to inhale it, right? Right, but you okay. see the way most artists are taught. You know what what they believe to be adequate ventilation is opening a window in their studio, mm -hmm. which is not adequate ventilation. Uh, and that's why we advocate eliminating solvents from uh, from oil painting. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's possible. You can you certainly don't need to use solvents to clean brushes. Mm -hmm. I use soap. And, yeah. and you actually, yeah, you can just use, you can use mm -hmm. oil. Uh, mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an old chemist adage that says like dissolves like. So <laughs> oil will dissolve oil paint. It will, it will uh, help you clean it. And so, and then just with soap and water, you remove the oil. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's one way. And then, of course, uh, painting without salt, oil painting without solvents is completely possible. And you don't have to resort to these water miscible oil paints, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. which, are, which are essentially compromised oil paints, because in order to make them water miscible, they put an additive in there. Uh, and they and they restructure the chemistry of the oil so that it's friendly to water. It becomes uh, becomes uh, hydrophilic, and as that's of course the biggest enemy of of painting is water. Water destroys paint eventually. It destroys everything. Actually, mm -hmm. it's 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 we need it for a living, but it eventually breaks down everything that we know. So um, so that's. That's an important point. I, I would like to go back to one point, you know, we didn't cover, which is you you asked about um, the permanency or the light fastness of colors. Mm -hmm. Do natural pigments uh, as opposed to synthetic? The issue really isn't whether it's natural or synthetic. The issue really is more about whether it's organic or inorganic. 
Uh, and recently, uh, a number of companies have discovered, and we're, we're participating in these studies as well, as part of the American Society of Testing Materials, that the rating system on the tubes of paint that we use today, which comes from the American Society of Testing Materials, uh, is giving false positives. In other words, oh, what wow. we believed to be light fast may not actually be light fast. And so there is an urgency to develop a new test. And unfortunately, most of the manufacturers of paint today are not willing to participate yeah. industry-wide standard or test method. Uh, however, just recently, we're happy to announce that Windsor & Newton has agreed to participate in the study. We are participating in the study, natural pigments, as well as golden artist colors, only three companies. Uh, that's at least enough. Well, that speaks volumes. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, uh, it would be good if we get more to participate, and they should, because mm -hmm. it's their industry. It's not just ours, mm -hmm. it's their industry also. And it's the artists that either benefit or do not benefit by the results of these. Because now we don't really know which, and it's primarily the organic pigments, are actually light fast and which ones are not. So, and it has, again, it has really little to do with the fact that they're modern or they're all ancient pigments or whether they're, uh, uh, you know, synthetic or natural. It has to do with the pigment chemistry. So that's, that's uh, an important point. We've been <laughs> preaching that, uh, by the way, for a number of years with artists and even with the manufacturers, but we, uh, it seems to fall on deaf ears for the most part. So that's why we are, uh, we are lucky because by the, from the beginning, we just choose do not work with organic pigments <clears throat> because again, as a ruby of colors, we choose to have original idea was the pigments what were uh, were invented before 1850 because right after that the revolution of this you know one of the after another all this uh, beautiful unorganic and inorganic pigments started to uh, pop up and so we thought everybody else doing these colors why to bother and of course later we a little bit switch uh, the idea because artists now wanted us to make even modern colors but way how we make without any additives so we do have cadmiums let's say so because this is already 19th century uh, colors and so but in most cases so we have only two uh two, two Organ organic pigments, organic pigments yeah. so we have alizarin and uh, uh, prussian blue and that's it. Most companies. But most companies, when you look on the back of the tubes, you will at least, figure out. At least 50% of their line are organic pigments. And so it's and what a big we're, concern. What we're talking about are the phthalos, the quinacridones, the hansas. Hansas. The benzodiazepines. The, the very strong, colors. strong colors. So they're all very strong, strong colors. colors. They're, but be they're are, beautiful colors, obviously. But they are most questionable. But now. we don't really know if they are light fast or not. I see. I'd like to ask you about the mediums for oil painting. Uh, which one is the best? Is the best medium in terms of archival qualities? The best medium for oil painting is oil. no medium. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I thought it's like no medium. <laughs> no medium, really. Uh, uh, you know, it's uh, and you know, even though like our we make lots of different mediums, we make a wide array of mediums. But we always tell artists, don't use them unless they fulfill a certain task. Mm -hmm. The problem with today is, like Tanya mentioned already, is that, you know, a, a teacher will have students and the teacher found in their work that a particular medium suits their style and their technique. So obviously they teach that style and technique and along with it, they teach the medium, but they don't explain to the students why use the medium. That's a problem. 
because then the students think that the only way they can paint is with that medium. And that's not correct. And in fact, the best way to paint is without any medium, just using paint. Uh, but that's why we have but, different behavior of the paint right. every tube. Uh, so then at least people will use least amount of medium right. if they do need. But the, but the but. mediums can be effective in terms of extending their ability to achieve a certain visual effect. And that's the only reason to use a medium is mm -hmm. when you need it to achieve, let's say, a texture, a particular type of brush stroke or a blending of two, you know, two paint uh, paint passages. That's important. So the safest what we do have in our line, of course, it's um, like in pasta medium or Velasquez medium. But again, always we when people <coughs> call us, we ask you first when when the question comes, what medium should I use? We will ask you a question, what do you want to achieve? And then we will suggest for you. We're like doctors, you know, you come <laughs> to us. So <laughs> let's say if I want to paint um, very thick texture, mm -hmm. like Rembrandt did, mm -hmm. what kind of medium should I use? So we recommend like a paste medium. And what we mean by that is a medium that actually has a pigment in it. But the pigment is... Uh, has no basic color. I mean, it, it kind of gives the medium a whitish color, but when you mix it in with your colors, it disappears completely. In other words, it, mm -hmm. it, even though it looks white, it doesn't behave like a white color. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't tint the color. Mm -hmm. It just gives it bulk. And it's actually the same strategy that a lot of paint, uh, paint makers use when they want to make a student grade paint. So in order to use less pigment, and pigment is the biggest cost in paint, mm -hmm. uh, they simply add an extender pigment that has no effect or very little effect on the color. And so, um, and so what they're doing is they're just simply bulking the paint up and using less of the colorant which, which of course drives the most expensive part of the paint. That's what Rembrandt did. Mm -hmm. uh, Velasquez did. Mm -hmm. they, they would add chalk into their paint. Okay. And uh, or silica, and they would extend the paint so that they could bulk it up. And mm -hmm. uh, and that's a very effective use uh, to create an impasto effect. That's how Rembrandt and Velasquez created any kind of impasto in their effects. Thank you for sharing that. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's very interesting. <laughs> I'm going to try it. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I want to ask you about um, the gilding supplies. You have a whole section on, on your yeah. website selling the supplies. Could you share, um, could you describe the basic process of gilding uh, a canvas or a panel. I'm assuming gilding on panel is a lot ba better, but yes. could you share the process um, with the mentioning the supplies that you sell? So sure. it makes more sense to. Sure. So basically, uh, gilding involves a very thin leaf of metal. And it could be gold, it could be silver, it could be aluminum, copper. Uh, bronze, or it could be a, a composite of these metals. Uh, and then what you're all, what you're basically doing is adhering the leaf mm -hmm. onto the substrate. But in that process, and what most, maybe not most gilders, but gilders who are trying to achieve what we, what they call bright gold or highly polished gold, Something that, like, for instance, you may see on an icon, as an example. Mm -hmm. It's very brilliant. looks like yeah. a highly or metallic surface. It gives the, the uh, illusion that it's made of metal. Uh, and so in order to achieve that, that means you really need to have a very smooth surface. Because one thing gold does, and gold very well, and the other leaf to, to a lesser degree, uh, it will it will show up any imperfection in the base. So you have to have, so, and that's where the preparation of the base is so important. You have to have a very smooth surface 
So you have to get this highly polished surface and mm -hmm. then you apply the, the adhesive and that could be a number of different things. It could be oil, it could be water-based adhesives and we have all the different types. Usually water-based adhesives are preferable for uh, decorating objects, uh, whereas oil-based adhesives were developed primarily for architectural decoration, like outdoors. Uh, I see. Uh, okay. Because needed a longer uh, open time. Uh -huh. Water-based materials have a very short open time, so that you need to, as soon as you apply the adhesive, you need to then work with the gold or the metal leaf immediately. And then of course, once you lay it down, you, you need to maybe, if you want a, a very polished effect, you need to polish it. And the problem that, that it's become, uh, today it's become kind of a trend where a lot of artists are exploring the use of, of metal leaf in their work and it's beautiful. And mm -hmm. there's a number of artists who have been very successful in doing that. Brad Kunkel is a mm -hmm. good example he's using uh, lots of silver leaf and uh, and getting good results from that and that's great uh, but a lot of artists they think that they can get into gilding without very little any preparation or training and that's very difficult to do it yeah without. it's actually a very difficult it process very difficult. yeah and and, yeah. and it and it is reasonably to understand why because it is a uh, it's a very precise process to do it well. And, uh, and you know, we see a lot of artists thinking that they can get into it. And unfortunately, it's perpetuated. You know, you walk into a Michaels now and you see a little uh, rack of, of, you know, composite metal and, and some things. And, and, and people believe, oh, I can just get into this and it's very easy. And then they struggle with it. Mm -hmm. So it does make sense to find a good teacher learn what they're doing and uh and then explore it doesn't mean you can't explore it without that but but to really get the wide range of results you do need a good teacher that's for mm -hmm. sure what's the good sealant for for the silver leaf or gold leaf so basically in gold <clears throat> you actually don't want to seal the gold especially okay. if it's a highly polished surface mainly because it will actually detract from the highly polished surface. Now, of course, if you're doing what we call matte gold, which is not polished, mm -hmm. as a kind of a matte looking effect, uh, putting an, a varnish, any varnish will do. Just keep in mind that for silver and some uh, other metals like aluminum, and uh, they will develop a patina even mm -hmm. with varnish on top. Because uh, a lot of people think that, and and the unfortunately the word seal <laughs> in the english language at least derives this concept that it's that it is absolutely impermeable that it's non-destructive and so forth and that's the farthest thing it offers a little bit of protection but it doesn't seal anything it just it offers more protection from abrasion and a little protection from light not much uh, and very little protection from moisture. A little bit, not wow. a lot. Okay, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, so it'll, it'll obviously slow down the effect of, of moisture, which can cause corrosion, let's say, of metal, uh, but it doesn't prevent it. But some people like that, by the way. They like the patina, the aging effect, and that's why they will use um, uh, colored bases underneath gold or other mm -hmm. metals. That's traditional because they understand that the metal will wear off. Mm -hmm. And when it does, it has that nice kind of patina, natural patina. For silver, it's black or blue. For gold, it's red or yellow and so forth. Please don't do that on canvas. But canvas, <laughs> it's, it's, really, you know, it's really a shame. When we see it on canvas, it's like, really? <laughs> yeah, because you need to understand that it's uh, metal, even if it's look not even close as a metal, so it's very thin and so, but overall, it's once you glue and uh, canvas is doing this, mm -hmm. day in, day out, it will break your gold and uh, it doesn't matter what uh, under gold you will put, it still will be uh, broken. And so then mm -hmm. it's a waste of, unless you do want that 
curricular, you know, on your or the you know, or the appearance of, can yeah. of canvas, you yeah, know, because that's so what that's it's going to show. that's different, yeah. of course. But yeah. we we do have now last uh, five years probably people just uh, calling us about gilding. That's why originally we had only for iconography, and so and we mm -hmm. absolutely <clears throat> the most case it was uh, water gilding. Well, what are the best panels for gilding? Uh, I'm assuming aluminum or maybe wood panels. Wood is good, um, and as you, as you may know, we, we started a, a second company called Artifacts that specializes in uh, aluminum composite um, panels. Mm -hmm. Really, um, aluminum composite com panels really provide perhaps the most stable support that artists can paint on today. Mm -hmm. uh, now, there may be something in the future that we'll find that's even better, but today, it provides a very stable support because it's not it's not susceptible to warping. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not susceptible to changes in relative humidity or or susceptible to moisture. So it doesn't have a lot of the problems that either wood or canvas presents. Um, and so um, when we started that company, uh, aluminum composite was uh, still quite expensive. Nowadays it's uh, almost the same <clears throat> price what we see the wood. people would. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's what I noticed, or yeah. even canvas. I, I mean, what's the point yeah. of buying a canvas uh, exactly. if, if it costs about the same? But the weight is different, you know, it, it weighs so much more. In terms of wood, the, wood will, uh, actually will. It, it weighs uh, much less. Much more. Wood will actually weigh more, yeah. and and the wood the price of wood has gone up so incredibly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I'm, and, and I'm not talking about like I'm, yeah you can buy you know a very inexpensive uh, hardboard panel, uh, but you see that hardboard panel is so you know it's like a eighth of an inch thick and it's, mm -hmm. it's to warping, and if you're going to do canvas and canvas can be a good support in under some circumstances. But to do it right, like having the really strong, heavyweight canvas, especially for a larger picture, with really good supports and a good support, auxiliary support structure behind the canvas, and then adding uh, protective backings behind. Once you get through with that, you're probably going to spend the same amount of money. Mm -hmm. I think uh, on and, our, and I think on artifacts, uh, Anton even has a specific like range. Like, look how much that will weigh compared to something else. And so, I think artifacts has this even table or some. Uh, I don't remember. I know they they had the video on that uh, because the weight definitely not an issue anymore the price is not an issue anymore it's uh but the sizes yes so because I mean, it's still we still when you're doing large sizes you know to roll up a canvas is of mm -hmm. course much easier yeah sh shipping is shipping a you know yeah. a large panel obviously that's that's correct and and mm -hmm. and that's the one that's the one disadvantage in in these panels as opposed to uh rolling up a canvas but if you if you don't do that, then you know everything becomes equal, and and now you have here a support, and n you know now we have even for large sizes we have supports where it's two thin sheets of aluminum, and there's an aluminum honeycomb core. And it's even lighter. That is even light. That's so light. It's amazing, and it's oh. even much stronger. Yeah. Uh, then the standard uh, aluminum composite panel that has a solid plastic core. So oh, it's okay. even lighter. If Interesting. You, <laughs> size, yeah. And in go, fact, we go don't. Go visit uh, artifacts.be. Yeah. And so you will see all of uh, all of that. Um, and In he information. Has, and he has like 22 different surfaces. So you can really choose what you want. Yeah, you can still yeah. paint on canvas. So for acrylics, Acrylic. for draw, drawing, he even has now uh, the paper adhered to that. Uh, everything possible. Tempera. Tempera. Yeah, we developed a temper ground for it. Yeah. And it's really, so there's, it's, it's really, it's, it makes a lot of sense for artists to, and, but you know, some artists still, um, uh, still want to paint on wood. They like 
that or they want to continue painting on a canvas. And of course, that's that's a valid mm -hmm. choice. Always the choice should be based on aesthetics rather than simply, you know, mechanical. Mm -hmm. Well, guys, I, I can talk to you forever. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I think we need to <laughs> quit. <laughs> yeah, we do. Would, would, would you like to add anything else before we quit? <laughs> I think the only th the thing that we encourage artists to do is, uh, I always say to artists because not because I'm a little bit biased with science and art. Uh, science is not a detractor from art, and in fact, many artists have always said that science and art are really intersecting, and I believe that. And there's a lot of good things that can come out of it. We and I think that natural pigments is is actually proof of that itself. So, I just uh, want to thank artists, uh, thinking artists, because this is, it's true, it's a little bit more difficult to work with them because they, they know what they want and it's very specific, but at the same time, uh, we do know that they care what, uh, what future doing, yeah. generation will see because we now know that 20th century art definitely will be lost due to materials and uh, practices so and too. practices mm -hmm. yes and so uh, we we love our artists we appreciate and so we we are willing to work with them and so that's why we have uh, even artists we, we make special batches for them because they really know what they want and uh, and if you don't know what you want, call us. We will we will explain whatever <laughs> you you need. <laughs> who 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 is the, uh, who was the most famous artist who called you? We hate to say that, but uh, but George always afraid. Then it's friendship, of course. But John Curran is the probably the best uh, friend for George, who really. Uh, John Curran is what we understand then, this is the thinking artist. He really... Mm, interesting, uh, I didn't know that about yeah. him. John, uh, and, and, and we've had many conversations, but John really knows his materials. Huh. Uh, okay. He's very controversial among, yeah. among people, but uh, but he is he's uh, um, very knowledgeable about what he's doing. It's it amazes me actually. Wow, uh, that's, I know that's a lot good. Of paint, <laughs> paint from a from a whole every, different every time in his uh, studio, mm -hmm. uh, they it it feels like these two people from different worlds are they talking same language but from <laughs> different perspective because um, John is using almost all our colors and so he knows absolutely every each of them and he's teaching us on many occasions where he's saying then look what I did and we were like what <laughs> we didn't even expect that so but I, I mean I can tell you we have the whole list of and I I just afraid to miss every uh, somebody so yeah, there's, many, there's we, actually many other artists but that you ask we, like we what's enjoy. the most yeah. known probably mm -hmm. would be would be him so but yeah there's many other artists that we and we especially enjoy the interaction with these artists it's and in why fact we, it's we really go into studios it's why it's important for us because that's how we we developing our materials too because i every time saying then 50 percent of our uh big uh, the our ideas. colors yeah, yeah. and ideas and mediums tears of the artist because when we come to studio and they say and then listen i spent so many years and i i still can't find that material what will do this for me and george was like okay we will do it <laughs> so, and uh, very often it doesn't bring us any money because it's uh, uh because what works for one again you see mm -hmm. that's what we are mentioning what works for one completely will not work for somebody else that's why it's all individual it's why i always think all our artists because all of them combining uh making who we are well thank you so much for sharing your story and for you know sharing your expertise um i'm very honored to have you 
and uh, I wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your opportunity. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye Bye now. (laughs) Bye-bye. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, All the links are in the show notes. Uh, Take care. Bye-bye.